Good day. My name is Leslie Armstrong, and thanks for the opportunity for the three of us to share our research, businesses, and practices with you. While Claire Gagnon, Patricia Bishop, and I all have our own professional work and businesses, we met at the Atlantic Natural Fiber and Dye Industries Association, and FADIA, a loosely woven group of designers, producers, academics, and farmers. And Francis told you a bit about the group this morning. After um, our two and a half day symposium in 2011, the three of us submitted a proposal, coincidentally, coincidentally titled So to So, a common, <laughs> common name, to the Nova Scotia Department of Agriculture in two, June 2012 to research, grow, and eventually process fiber flax for textile production using both the short and long fibers. Our eyes were also on the potential of growing hemp and other bast fibers and the industries that can be developed with the byproducts. And Claire will tell you a bit about that. Claire will talk to you about her research into the machinery needed to process flax, both the cottage industry size and large scale. And Patricia will talk to you about her first venture into growing two acres of flax this summer in the Annapolis Valley of Nova Scotia. I'm a weaver by trade, and I'm going to talk to you about production weaving on a much different scale than the previous two speakers. Um, I was born in Nova Scotia and have lived here most of my life. Um, started my most recent venture um, in 2004 uh, with NESCAD colleague Anka Fox, who's here with us today in the audience. Anka left to pursue other textile work, and I continued on with the now named Armstrong Textiles. The business model is based on a small, flexible production production model using vintage power looms with the use of hand looms for prototypes and custom orders. So these are a few shots from uh, when Anka and I first started in 2004, using alpaca, merino, primarily. More recent work, ragamuffin, man skirt, throw. <laughs> um, and here's what one of the looms they work on, called the Hattersley Domestic, Domestic Loom. And maybe some of our British visitors will know about the Hattersley Loom. It was developed um, in Yorkshire, England in the early part of the 20th century. Made of cast iron and using cams to operate the harnesses and picking motion, the Hattersley Domestic was manufactured originally with two foot pedals the weaver would use to produce the energy needed to weave. So very good for soccer training. This type of foot power um, is used to weave Harris tweed, and it's still legislated as the required method in Scotland. However, my Hattersley is connected to a small motor, and so while one has to constantly watch the operation, one doesn't have to put da push down on the pedals and throw the shuttle by hand, and therefore can wind bobbins on the nearby bobbin winder. This is a wonderful little workhorse, and I'm quite enamored with the um, cast iron parts and working parts of the machine. The positives of this type of vintage power loom for weaving is the ease of operation and maintenance. Secondly, is versatile in changing warps, so you can put on 10 yards or 100 yards. And thirdly, the loom is um, relatively flexible in a variety of densities of fabric. So a few parts. One negative is the limits created by the two sets of cams in my possession, allowing only plain weave and twill weave for the weavers in the room. So no complex structures. As is often in the case these days with weaving, training is an issue. Um, and especially in Nova Scotia, there is no weaving industry of any kind and virtually uh, no weavers experienced in industrial looms. For um, more complex, I'm just showing here actually one of the, um, oh yeah, Anka and I wove a kilometer of fabric with a nylon and linen paper yarn. This is to show that it actually is quite flexible in what you can weave on it. So these were the draperies at the Hespler um, Library in Cambridge, Ontario. So it's to show there is quite a bit of flexibility even though um, Harris Tweed is usually 100% wool fabric. These are the fabrics. So this was nylon and linen paper yarn from Habu in New York. For more complex structures, two American Crompton and Knowles <laughs> C&K vintage 16 harness Dobby power looms, probably Beth Ann knows of these, 
circa 1950, arrived one day, quite suddenly, on a flatbed trailer from my friend Warren Seelig in Maine, bless his heart. We didn't know whether to curse him or kiss him, but not only did one loom have to be pirated from the other loom for parts, but a bobbin winder also had to be built. Unfortunately, this loom, it has a, had a wonderful history in that it wove the original Olivetti typewriter ribbon but it had, had the warp and stop filling motions um, taken out, and that makes the weaving immeasurably more difficult. The positives of this loom, complex structures could be woven on it, including double cloth and double beam fabrics. The negatives, again, lack of skilled workers. The loom is very noisy, uh, requires maintenance that is really beyond me, and it, this is a charming, a charming way to um, do the pattern, but you have to peg this wooden chain by hand. So sometimes I have fun with my chains and make snake-like <laughs> structures with them. At the workshop, um, we have a beautiful teak warping mill. It's manually operated with a motor um, custom built on the back so that I can take off the warps easily. But it's, some of the um, images are quite lovely with the yarn stretched around this. So there I am taking off the warp on a much smaller scale than Beth Ann's place. What are some of the alternative models for production weaving on a small scale in Nova Scotia and elsewhere? The hand loom can quickly wear a body out. The fly shuttle loom, which is still widely used in other parts of the world, I was amused by a 1961 master, Canadian master weaver bulletin which described the weaver who used a fly shuttle loom as unscrupulous and inferred they were somehow morally corrupt. <laughs> so, there are computer-aided looms, of course, production looms, like the AVL Industrial Dobby Loom out of California, which, although not very fast for an electric loom, powered loom, they do have the advantages of doing the strenuous work for you and no Dobby chains to peg. In order to use these more industrial looms efficiently, long runs should be woven on them, and they should be in operation constantly to pay their way. The price tags on owning the computerized and industrial looms are high and has to be carefully factored into your operation. What are the other scenarios? A model that seems to have a lot of benefit to me is to maybe share selected resources. A group of production weavers or other textile producers could share services, administrative, marketing, sales, and technical services. A computerized industrial power loom and other costly equi equipment could also be operated by a technician and shared and paid for on a time basis. The entity that owns this equipment and houses the personnel, I don't know, could it be a legal cooperative, privately owned venture, or a government funded incubator? Does it make sense to separate the design and production, for instance? A Nova Scotian producer could contract out large runs or larger runs of cloth to a mill such as the wonderful Oriole Mill in North Carolina. Does this outsourcing change the intent of sustainable textile production? Equally, one might ask, would the concept of sustain sustainability change if the bulk of the weaving production took place in a women's weaving co-op in India? In both cases, the US or India, these imported fabrics could be le legitimately labeled with some of or all of the following labels that we see in stores right now. Fair trade, organic materials, energy conscious, made by a co-op, handmade, etc., etc. There are many models from which to choose, and in Nova Scotia we have our own spe specific set of circumstances. On the one hand, we have the major drawback, um, the lack of a textile industry, and therefore the lack of support systems the yarn producers, the weaving mills, the finishing mills, the sewers. We're also burdened with high shipping costs. On the other hand, we have excellent conditions for growing vast fibers such as flax and hemp and for raising some breeds of fiber producing animals. We have an increasing number of young graduates interested in pursuing textile and fashion careers. Additionally, there is a growing public demand for local goods and food here in Nova Scotia. That's gaining a lot of momentum positively affecting our young worth workforce. Each producer must um, decide for themselves what their goals are, what their intentions are within the parameters of this hopeful and challenging world of sustainability. Thanks.